Hey folks, this is Ben from Road to VR and this is CES 2015. We're here at the Razer booth to learn more about the OSVR project and the HDK headset, uh, which Razer and Sensix revealed today. So we have Yuval here from Sensix, he's the CEO, and we have Chris from Razer. And these guys uh, have been working on this project for, I think you said it's, it started some 18 months ago? About 18 months ago, yes. And can you tell me a little bit about what, what, was, the, what was the impetus? Well, I think the impetus is that virtual reality seems a natural extension to gaming. That's something uh, Razer is, is famous for exploring new technologies. Not all of them make it to market. So I think Razer got very curious about virtual reality and said, you know, how do we start learning about this? How do we figure the art of the possible? And uh, what you see here, the HDK, is actually the third iteration that we went through together. Um, so it's been, uh, it's been a fun process, but not a short one. Great, and Chris, on, on Razer's end, um, what, what's kind of the long-term strategy? I mean, you, you guys are known for making PC peripherals, um, and as far as I understand, you know, they're not open, but you wouldn't necessarily want them to be, but this is a totally different thing. This is right. open headset, open, so, open source uh, SDK. How does that all work out for you guys in the end? Right. Well, as you just mentioned, we're known for our peripherals and they're not open and that's probably also what you'll see uh, from us in the VR space as well. Ultimately, the, the project that we've kicked off with OSVR is, is they kind of to create that space in virtual reality gaming, but um, what you'll see in, in the consumer space from Razer is, is probably going to be on the peripheral side of things. And so let's talk a little bit about the headset. It's the HDK or the Hacker Development Kit. Um, is this, is what we're seeing here, uh, how much is it going to change between what we see now and uh, what people will actually be able to buy when it becomes available in June, was it? Yeah, the, the headset is going to be available in June for $199. Um, I think we are always improving the, the units. I mean, we're always looking at displays, we're looking at what's the best positional tracking that should be in the system. Uh, we're looking at various aspects of it, but I think fundamentally, uh, even as it stands right now, you know, 1080p display, high quality optics, super expandable system in terms of ports, your ability to hack, your ability to change the software. I mean, it's a nice HMD, uh, even as it stands today, and I think it will be nicer by the time um, it ships in June. And is, so right now I'm looking at a, at a picture of it off screen. We have, it has OSVR logos all over it. Are we, is this what it's going to ship like and it's always going to be called the OSVR SDK and then Razer may have their own Razer version? Or, or is this eventually going to be Razer branded once it actually goes out? No, this is absolutely OSVR. It's, it's, it's designed uh, by Razer, um, but we're not, um, like it's not a Razer product. It's like for us, a Razer product is a consumer-facing product. It's um, something that um, ultimately uh, we want consumers to use, uh, and they're usually also not open. Um, so uh, what we're looking at here is really an OSVR product that basically Razer's manufacturing that's been designed between Razer and, and Sensix. Um, so yeah, it's not a Razer product per se. And Yuval, you have been working in the professional HMD field for a long time, and in that area, it is high cost, high performance. Consumer world is completely different. What is it like building a, a head-mounted display that has to be affordable but also good enough? I mean, it's certainly a learning experience. On one hand, we say, okay, which of our high-end uh, technologies can we fit inside? And on the other hand, how do we make it manufacturable? How do we make it uh, cost-effective enough? And then, of course, in OSVR, there's the whole uh, software component that comes in, uh, which you know our existing high-end products are not open source, and so building both an open source uh, HMD as well as an open source SDK has been a lot of fun. And when you guys are you guys are going to put out the the OSVR SDK, um, which is designed to do more than just interface with the headset, can you elaborate on that? Well, the, another big problem in VR right now is that there's a million different input devices or input yeah, ways of controlling uh, virtual reality in games, right? So um, you have very, well, somewhat exotic or new stuff like the Vertex Omni or uh, stuff like that, um, or slightly more conventional ones like motion sensing or even camera-based gesture tracking, stuff like that. Um, 
but for a game to kind of understand all these inputs, um, it, it needs to do a lot of development if, if it goes to individually tries to work with all the SDKs. So that's kind of what, what O3R set out to solve from the get-go. Like, um, we're providing the plugins, um, we're providing the framework so that uh, everyone can make their own input device compatible with OSVR, understandable to game engines in that sense, um, and, and solve that problem not just on the HMD side but also on the input device side, yeah. And you've all, um, so the optics inside are dual element. That's different from most of the consumer facing headsets that we've seen since Oculus. H how, do, how does that change it? Uh, what's better? What might be worse? When you have two elements instead of one, you have twice the cost. Uh, that's the downside. The upside is that when you have more degrees of freedom, you can control the optical parameters better. You can make an image that's in focus all the way to the edges. You can make um, an image that does not need uh, pre-distortion or color correction. I mean, I can basically show you the desktop of your PC right on this as is, and it'll be very readable. Now. It still does not mean that uh, people who adopt this might choose to turn it into a single element um, model, but we wanted to push the art of the possible and sort of wanted to push the envelope both, both on the openness and some of the performance parameters, and we felt this is a good way to do it. And so a lot of, a lot of VR enthusiasts are, are going to look at this and say, they may say, it looks great, um, but there's no positional tracking right now. You talked a little bit about this. Since it's so modular, it should be possible to put that in at some point. Are there any ongoing plans or discussions about making that happen? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it could go in, in multiple ways. Um, you know, uh, Sensex and Razor can do something and may very well do something by the time it ships in June. Or maybe the community decides, maybe there's someone who says, oh, I've got this great positional tracking solution, I'm going to put it in. You know, one thing that happens in open source as you think about giving people the freedom, a choice of the hardware and software they want to use, we go into uh, meetings and say, which option are we going to use? Which technology are we going to use for this feature or that feature? Say one, two, or three. And sometimes we say, yes, all of the above. And we'll let the market decide which one is more popular, which one gives them the right performance in the right um, usage scenario. So, yes, I think there's going to be positional tracking. Uh, whether it comes from us or the community, we'll see, but maybe all of the above. And I wanted to talk a little bit a little bit about the specs. So it's a 5.5 inch 1080p panel that does 60 hertz. Um, are you doing the low persistence right now? Is that planned at some point, or is that something you could drop in at some point? Yes, we could drop it in at some point with regards to our electronics. Um, if you wanted to make Ben's goggles tomorrow morning, take a panel, plug it in. I mean, we have all the specs on how to do it. We make it easy to replace the panel with the panel of your choice. So, same answer as before. Either we will do it or the community will do it. And so, walk me through that real quick. Let's say it uh, comes with a 1080p panel. Let's say in a year I can go out and get a 5.5 inch uh, 2K panel. Um, What's the process of putting that in there? Can I do it and I know really nothing about electronics? Could I drop that in there and just plug it in? Well, I mean, you'd have to see what it takes depending on the change you want to do. So, for instance, if you wanted to install a camera on the front panel, you could say, okay, the, ca the front panel comes off, I'll take my drill, I'll drill a couple of holes, I'll put the camera, I'm done. If you want to change the FPGA on board to do some fancy video processing, maybe that's not for your layman, maybe you need to have some FPGA experience. So it depends on what you're trying to do. The point is that it doesn't have to come from Razor or Sensex. You will find someone that wants to do it, that knows how to do it, and that wants to either share or sell that knowledge to the rest of the community. Great, well thank you so much for filling us in guys, I really appreciate it. You've all, and Chris, thanks a lot.